God bless you. Clap your hands one more time to the Lord. Brother Lawrence is right. Brother Scott Graham's my best friend. Has been for a long time. I just wish he'd quit telling some of them stories. Because some of them stories are not conducive to that which is spiritual. <laughs> Anybody in here believe in God? Can you worship a God you don't understand? Is there anybody in here tonight? You've made it your goal. I'm not going to let the devil tell the truth on me. The book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 5, and again, thank you for allowing me to be here. You folks are so kind, so kind. And I am humbled by the invitation to even be here. A very, very humbling experience to speak to such great people. Y'all treated me so good. Nice evangelist quarters over there, comfortable had a basket full of goodies in there and you can tell I like goodies I, I don't have no convictions about snacks and uh, treated me so well brother Cooley and this entire staff I even had one of the young men today come up and want to take my truck out and wash it I couldn't believe it I told him I, I've got I kind of got a little deal running with this whole truck situation see I got that big old red truck out there and I went and had it cleaned up so nice, so pretty. And uh, my son, whom I preached about this morning, he decided he was going to take it out to feed his horses. He's got about 10 horses. Now, he's got a truck. I'm not sure why he chose mine. But he went out there after a, a big rainstorm. And uh, so it's kind of a running deal. I'm going to leave it just like it is until he goes and he cleans my truck. And then we'll see if he understands love without numbers. God bless you, Deuteronomy chapter number 5. Can I be a little controversial tonight? Deuteronomy chapter number 5. The Bible says in verse number 31. Deuteronomy 5, verse number 31. But as for thee, stand thou here by me, and I will speak unto thee all the commandments and the statutes and the judgments which thou shalt teach them, that they may do them in the land which I give them to possess it. And you shall observe to do therefore as the Lord your God hath commanded you. You shall not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. <clears throat> you shall walk in all the ways which the Lord your God hath commanded you, that ye may live and that it may be well with you and that ye may prolong your days in the land which ye shall possess. These verses take place shortly after God gives Moses the Ten Commandments. And God said, now Moses, go give them these Ten Commandments. And when the Ten Commandments are done, <clears throat> tell them I said, these words that I read to you tonight. Now, I'm smart enough to know that when I give you my title, some of you folks are going to scratch your head and say, hmm, I didn't know that. And some of you all going to say, mm hmm, I always knew that. You are that beautiful age, that beautiful dimension of life where you're developing ministries and you're developing lifelong traits, and it's very common for you to see from church to church certain differences in standards and I'm going to be controversial tonight certain differences in this that or the other and uh, I uh, I'm going to deal with something tonight <laughs> just don't turn up your nose because I'm going to preach tonight I believe in rings. I believe <laughs> it's so quiet you could hear a church mouse licking ice in the back of a pew somewhere. I believe in rings. <laughs> 
Well, let's lift our hands up and ask God to bless this meeting tonight. Would you do that? In Jesus' name, God bless you. Don't stone me yet. Let's start this message tonight by settling the issue on some things. I love having real church. Ain't got no time for no fake church. Ain't got no time for kind of church. Ain't got no time for almost church. I love having real church. If you love having real church, you ought to clap your hands real good right now. I, well, you probably noticed, it's hard for me to stand up on a platform. I, I, I'm already, you know when you're a big man, you're already insecure. You don't like sitting on the front row because you stick out farther than everybody else. You don't, do, I, I just, I like being, I like to get down and worship with everybody else. I, <laughs> because more than God called me to preach, God called me to worship. And I love having real church. I just simply believe in having real church. Sound man, that sounds wonderful right there. But I, I got to tell you, I absolutely, I positively, I uncompromisingly love having real church. I love the worship of the church. It keeps me on fire for God. I love the prayer of the church. It keeps me in touch with God. I love the preaching of the church. It keeps me in tune with God. I love the, the fellowship of church. It keeps me in step with the body of Christ. But as much as I love church, I've got to be honest with you, there are certain times when I go to certain environments and I see certain things happen that kind of makes you stop and wonder, where in the world did we get the layout of what we call church? Now, by saying that, I, uh, <coughs> I've noticed the last few nights that uh, last night, this morning, and tonight, we came in, we sung several courses, and then we had, we had greet the congregation, we'd pray, and then you'd have a special, and then and then it was time for me to preach. It's just the standard order of church. And and uh, one of the things that, that always amazes me, where did we get, who, who, who decided that, that when we come to church we're supposed to do it that way? There are certain things that we do in our services and things that we, uh, certain ways that we act that if you were on the outside looking in, you'd probably scratch your head and say, uh, I'm not sure where that's at now 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 there's a lot of things that we do that <clears throat> we don't necessarily have a lot of good strong bible backing to do I'm not here to destroy your faith in the church. I'm not doing that tonight, even though I am preaching about I believe in rings. But I, I let me give you an example. Here a few weeks ago, I got this uh, young girl in my church. She's got all the zeal in the world. She just ain't got all the wisdom in the world yet. And sometimes those things need to balance themselves out. And, and uh, she came to me, and she was excited. She said, Brother White, I've been witnessing to somebody. I said, great. She said, she said, this woman told her, you know, I, I'm looking for a church, but I want a church that's got, you know, good Sunday school or something for my kids. I, got, I want a church. And she said, well, you need to come visit our church. And she said, well, what do you all have at your church? And she said, oh, let me tell you about our church. She said, our church is crazy. And I thought, well, that's probably not the best first step, but let's see what happens. She said, I mean, our church is crazy. She said, they get all worked up at our church. When our pastor starts preaching, said, do you know they run up and throw neckties at him while he's preaching? And I'm thinking, oh, my God in heaven. I said, well, baby, what else, what else happens? You know, what did you talk to her about? She said, well, I told her at our church that we, we run the aisles. I told her that you need to come to our church. We run the aisles and we clap our hands and we scream and shout and, and we dance. And she said, we act like we just lost our minds. And, and uh, she said, the woman looked at her and said, really? Is all that in the Bible? I didn't know that stuff was even in the Bible. And she said, oh, I told her, every bit of that's in the Bible. She said, I, I mean, it's all in the Bible. And, and she said, and I even got so worked up Brother White, I went home and she said, I found that scripture that said to clap your hands and I found the scripture that said to dance in the spirit and I found the scripture that told us uh, to shout to the Lord. She said, but you know, I never could find that scripture about running the aisles or throwing neckties. I, I never could find that. She said, where's that at in the Bible? Well, the truth of the matter is it's probably 
going to be really hard to find those particular scriptures because they're just not in the Bible. Can somebody shout amen? Obviously, the answer was there's no scriptures to, to back up running the aisles in church. Now, mind you, there's no scriptures that say you're not supposed to run the aisles, so I think that we're probably in good shape as far as that goes. But the fact is, there are some things that we do, there are some <coughs> traits that we take on that, 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 that sometimes we, 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 we get pretty wrapped up in those things and, and we just don't have a lot of good strong biblical foundation for that so, so and, and I see this is the part where y'all get to squirm and make me squirm but, 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 but there's some things that we do that we uh, we're, we're not out of order doing it but there's some things that we do that, that maybe we just don't have a whole lot of scripture for either by taking a stand against certain things or promoting certain things. There are certain elements that have become a part of our apostolic culture. To others, it may seem trivial or absurd, but to us, it's a vital part of having church. Does anybody in here really love having church? Is there anybody in here that just loves coming to the house of God and obeying the presence of God? So I, I've come today to tell you that there are issues that we deal with in the apostolic apostolic movement that we take a strong stand on. We take a strong stand on, on holiness issues and I think that we should. We take a great stand on worship and I think that we should. We take a strong stand in my church on the boundaries of our fellowship and I think that we should. We even have a pretty much a set scheduling when you go to church, for church to church and, and uh, I, I'm back to where I started at. Who said that church has to start with a song and then lead into an offering. Who said that after the offering we're supposed to, to open a door and have a few testimonies or, or have a special? Who said that after the special we got to give the announcements and have the choir? Who said that after the choir we got to have the preacher and the preacher's got to take it to the altar call? Well, Brother Watt, that's just the way we've always done it. It is, in fact, the way that most churches do that, but sometimes it's normal to look at certain things like that and say, I, I I wonder where that came from. Can somebody shout amen? i got to be honest with you. There are times that we almost structure ourselves. I, I meet with my staff every night before church starts and I, I, I let them know that we're going to either take this to a worship atmosphere, we're going to take it to a conviction atmosphere. We have our services very structured out. But I catch myself more and more telling them, I don't care what the structure is. I don't care what the schedule is. When we come to church, if you feel one flutter of the Holy Ghost moving you, you better follow after God and not after our traditions and not... Sometimes I wonder if some of the early apostles would even recognize the church that we have today compared to the day of Pentecost. And after all, this whole church business, if you please, seems to take on life right after the verses that I, I read to you today. Understand with me that, that we've got all these things that we preach, but in the beginning, it just seems so simple to, to have church. Now, let me explain that to you. The verses that I read to you tonight was right on the heels of God giving. Moses the Ten Commandments and, and he said Moses here's these things thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart thou shalt not steal thou shalt not kill he goes down the list of the Ten Commandments and then he said now Moses what you need to do is when you go to the people you tell them these are the ten requirements that I have in church but when you get done I want you to tell those people you shall observe that he sums up the grand total of what God was trying to say by telling them you shall observe to do these commandments and you should not turn from the, to the right hand or to the left hand you shall walk before the Lord your God as he's commanded you that you may live and it may be well and that your days may be prolonged upon the earth understand the basic interpretation of what God was trying to say right there just bear with me I got a lot of ground to cover and a short while to cover it God was trying to tell them here's your ten commandments this is 
what I want your society built around. But if you really want to make living for God easy, let me tell you how to do it. Keep my commandments and don't go looking for an easier way. Do what I told you to do and don't try to find a smoother way. Can I tell you that after all of these years, living for God is still just that simple. You've got to take the commandments of the Lord and then quit looking for a better way, an easier way. Problem is, people start looking for an easier way. You think we can do this without that? You think we can have the same kind of church without putting so much emphasis on, on the external? You think maybe we could have a bigger crowd if we'd put, put, quit putting so much emphasis on the doctrine? I'm going to tell you, I'm not looking to get a crowd. I'm looking to get a congregation. I'm not looking to get a bunch of people. I'm looking to get a church that I can present to him in that day. But the part that I find so intriguing is that God gave them ten basic commandments. And around those ten simple commandments, it has evolved into a, a culture of people. In this apostolic, apostolic church has taken on an entire culture of its own. I'm not condemning that. I'm just saying that it's sometimes confusing when you look that God gave us ten simple commandments. And it's turned into something where we have church that's got testimony services and prayer requests and running the aisles and throwing neckties and, and preaching. Preachers screaming their guts out. Altar calls, promoting spiritual disciplines of holding. I'm not saying any of that's wrong. And in fact, I believe that all of that's right. But I've got to tell you, what was it that got us from Ten Commandments to where we are today? What was it that took us there? Are you with me right now? I think what happened is when mankind, let me make this really simple for you tonight. In my heart of hearts, uh, to, to, to simplify it, I think what really happened, Brother Lawrence, is when people looked and saw that God had preferences, that God had, God had some likes and dislikes. There were some honest-hearted people that said, you know what, if God has likes and dislikes, if God has wants and wishes, if God has desires and things that he doesn't love, then maybe I need to find out what it's going to take for me to live for God in this day and age. If God's got expectations, I need to find out what it's like to live a life pleasing God. You see, here's something I've got to preach to this great congregation in this Bible college tonight. I hope you're not just here trying to find chapter and verse. I hope you're here trying to find a way that my life can please him. I hope you're here trying to find a way that my world can please him. telling you today is I think down through time there were those that said you know what I think it would please God if we gather together and have church more often and there were others that said I think it would please God if we worshiped with great passion somewhere somebody got in the presence of God and said it feels so good I got to do something and they jumped up and began to run the aisles uh, I think somewhere somebody said I think it would be pleasing to God if we'd separate ourselves uh, from all filthiness of the flesh if we laid aside certain things uh, that put a priority on our flesh uh, and took the attention away from God what I'm trying to tell you today is that we came from ten basic commandments to where we are today because somebody was honest hearted enough to say I'm not just here to follow chapter and verse I want to please God I want to please God I want to please God There was hungry hearted people that didn't want a religious tradition. They wanted a righteous experience. There were sincere souls that didn't want to just please their flesh. They wanted to please God. I'm talking about a love so sincere. You don't have to see a black and white command written in a Bible. A love so deep that you don't require a voice from heaven to make you back up and say there's some things I don't want to be a part of. I'm talking about a passion so pure that you don't need a pastor to spell out everything. You've got to have a relationship, not just with the words of a book, but with the author of the book. You've got to have a relationship with God.
got to preach to you today that God still loves a spirit that says, I don't need to see a literal command to know that there are some things I can't do and please God. Hunt as hard as you can hunt. You're not going to find that verse that says, Thou shalt not smoke marijuana. You're not going to find the verse that says, Thou shalt not freebase. You're not going to find the verse that tells you you're not supposed to molest children. So you listen to this preacher today when I'm telling you there's some things an honest-hearted individual just looks at and says, I don't need Ten Commandments. I need a relationship with God, and it'll take me beyond the letter of the law. That's why the Bible said the letter killeth, but the Spirit, the Spirit, the Spirit. Is there anybody that knows about being lost in the Spirit? Is there anybody that knows? God still loves the Spirit. <coughs> Is there anybody in here that understands God loves the Spirit? That says, you don't have to show me in black and white. A verse that spells out the dotting of the I and the crossing of the T to everything that I live. I'm telling you, there's something about a sincere man. Lord, have mercy. I feel the unction of the Holy Ghost right now to preach to somebody. There's something in the heart of a sincere man that says, I don't have to see it in black and white. If you're really sincere, there are some things you're going to touch that the Spirit of God's going to be troubled, and you're going to feel him vexed, and you're going to say, you know what? To please God, I don't have to touch that anymore. There are some places you're going to go that your spirit's going to be convicted. If you're really going to be a man or woman of God, if you're just going to be a pew ornament, you can do anything you want to and justify it but I'm talking about sincere people I'm talking about honest hearted people that say I've got to be used there are some things you're going to encounter that you have to say wait a minute I can't do that and stay close to God and you start that's when it becomes living for God instead of coming to church you understand there's a difference in living for God and coming to church so let me go on the record tonight by telling the congregation, you better be very careful when you try to throw away certain identifying traits of the church as not being spelled out in the Bible. Or look at those things and say, well, that's a little too old-fashioned. Don't be so quick to look at our stand on certain issues and call them legalistic or unreasonable. I'm here to preach to somebody tonight and tell you, you better understand that the great God that we serve, the God that knows all, that sees all that God is the one that's filled you with his spirit and there's some things inside of you that need to look at certain elements of the world and say I don't have to have a preacher preach against it I've got to have an experience that tells me that I can live closer to God if I live farther from the world I want to tell you where a lot of the things we preach come from I'm not saying they're not biblical I'm telling you there's principles in the Bible. There's things most of us should be preaching against that probably we don't preach against enough. But I'm going to tell you the things that you look at and say, well, I, I ain't found that verse yet that says, uh, thou shalt not do this, that, or the other. I want to tell you where a lot of that come from. It come from our forefathers who were so sincere before God. They laid on their face and cried out for God to give them direction, for God to give them to, uh, a meaning to these things. I've got to tell you today, you better be careful about before you throw away some of the landmarks they were given to you by men whose goal was pleasing God and not pleasing the flesh there's some things that we take a stand against that is not legitimized by chapter and verse but it's driven by a desire to protect the principles of God I wish somebody would jump to your feet and worship him right now I wish I could find somebody in this building that would say my passion is greater than any question I have. My desire is greater than anything. I don't understand. God bless you. Be seated. So what I'm saying is you don't have to have chapter and verse for everything you're doing if your real desire is to please God. There are going to be some things that make your righteousness recoil. And when it does, you've got to lay that thing down and hold on to that conviction for the rest of your life. And herein lie some of the issues that plagued the apostolic church in 2008. 
we don't have enough people that understand the power of real convictions. We've got people who obey rules. But Brother Carter, there's not enough people that understand convictions. Can I say, can you say amen tonight? Can, can, can I tell this congregation that what we've got to have is we've got to have an experience with God that is so sincere, that is so pure in its heart, that at some juncture you cross paths with certain things and say, wait a minute, I'm not going to do that anymore. And it becomes more than a preference. It becomes a conviction in your soul that says, I can't do that and feel right with God, so I'll never do that again. I'll never go there again. Brother White, do you really believe it's supposed to be that way? The apostolic movement has lost a lot of its power when we lost a lot of our conviction. It's got to be more than what your pastor preaches. It's got to be more than what the evangelist said. You've got to have a conviction. Uh, uh, uh. Sit down, i got to go on. You see, somewhere along the line, we need to understand that there are some commitments that should be made for the rest of our lives. And herein is the core of what I'm going to preach to this church today, this congregation. There are places you can go in God that God never intends for you to let go of. There are things that you can experience in God that he never intends for you to lay down. There are arenas that you can touch in God that he never intends for you to leave behind. I would to God there was somebody in here that understood what I'm preaching about right now. We can talk about church structure until the sun comes up in the morning. But the real first prototype, if you will, of church was the tabernacle in the wilderness. It was constructed to meet the spiritual needs. Are you with me right now? It was constructed to meet the spiritual needs of the children of Israel as they wandered from their journey to their wilderness experience and crossed into that blessed place called Canaan. Can you, can you understand tonight that, that, that they lingered in that wilderness for 40 years and the Bible said that they had a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night to lead them and to guide them. But understand that God's church has always been a church of transition. Even when it was frustrated, Brother Jirah, God's church has always been a church of transition. Some things are going to change. Some atmosphere Atmospheres are going to change. Some dynamics are going to change. But you want to know why Israel survived that? Because every time the cloud moved, they went and packed their stuff and said, when God moves, I'm moving with him. Every time the pillar of fire began to move, they began to run to their places because they had a mentality that said, my world revolves around the church. Can I tell you there was transition? Life went on in spite of the transitions. Because of that, the people understood that when God moves, I gotta move. When God flows, I, when God transitions, I've gotta transition. You gotta understand, nothing was more important to them. Nothing was more important than what God was doing. And what God was doing was always seen first. Oh, that we could understand the principle. What God was doing was always seen first at the church. Mind you, I know who I'm preaching to tonight, but I gotta tell you that if any group needs to hear what I'm gonna preach today, it needs to be this group that I stand before. I've got I've got a great pastor. Bishop Johnson is is my hero to this day, Bishop. Johnson is the greatest man that ever lived. Robert Johnson in Indiana, he's now retired from pastoring. He's about that tall. He's about that big around. But I'm telling you what he did. When I was a nobody, I crawled out from behind a dumpster to come to church for the first time. But I want to tell you what put me on the rock that I'm on. He'd put that crooked finger in my face and say, boy, if you're going to live for God, you got to pay the price. If you're going to serve God, you got to know what it's like to live it right. But I went and saw him the other day for the first time in almost a year. I'm preaching here and preaching there. And he's in South Bend, Indiana. And while I was in uh, Gaborone, Botswana, preaching their conference, I got the phone call that my pastor had been rushed in to surgery. They'd found cancer in his colon. The colon had torn loose, filled his body full of infection. They said he's not going to live. I got on the phone. I called him. I said, I'm coming home. My pastor's wife said, now, son, Brother Johnson said you was going to try to come back, but he told you to stay right there. 
because he taught you how to follow after God. And if you're there in the will of God, he'll be just fine here without you for 50 days. My bishop laid between life and death. Didn't know if he was going to see the light of day again. Ah, but God raised him up. They had to do massive surgery, but I hadn't seen him now, Brother Carter, in over a year. And when I saw him, he looked like he'd aged 20 years. His shoulders were stooped. And he walks on a, on a walker now. He still has the same fire of God in him. But when I looked at him, he's unsure on his feet. It's hard for him to stand up. Oh, but he's still my hero. Brother, why, where are you going to? The, the, the kingdom is transitioning. The kingdom is moving. Whether we want it to move or not, it's moving around us, Brother Lawrence. And I asked him, I said, Bishop, what's going to happen to me when you pass away? And he looked at me and he smiled from ear to ear. He said, son, you didn't see it. But while I've been living my life being your elder, God's making you the elder. And now I'm 46 years old and I preach more family camps than I do youth camps anymore. And I find myself drawn to a different dynamic of ministry. Oh, but I'm 46 years old now. I'm not what I used to be, but there is another transition coming to the kingdom. And that's those that I stand before today and preach to you. The kingdom is transitioning, and you better get ready. You better get ready because the church is going to be in your hands. The church is going to be in your hands. Where's the baby that, I'm sorry, you're not a baby. The young lady that came to me today and said, you prayed through in a camp right here. She came to me today. She said, Brother White, you don't know it, but I've got the Holy Ghost in a camp you were preaching in Mississippi years ago. Years ago. Are you listening to me now? And now she's in Bible school. And she's saying, God, I want to do something. Hey, where you at, buddy? That young man right there, stand up, son. I've known that guy for a long time. I've watched him run around different campgrounds. But you know what? Now he's in Bible school. And he's wanting to do something. Could you listen to this preacher today when I tell you there is a transition that's going on in the church? And if you're going to be what God wants you to be, you've got to get a grip on what God calls church. It's not what somebody else is preaching. you got to find out what it is that God considers church. I'm still, I'm, I'm, I'm still preaching. I believe in rings. Now listen to me. If you want to see church structure, it was spelled out in the cut. You better find out for yourself what God calls church. Don't take it from Doug White. What God calls church. Somewhere along the line, you got to get a. If the kingdom is transitioning, the kingdom is transitioning. There are some things that scare me to death when I look at young men that don't have this message in their spirit. And I think about this landing in their hands. It scares me to death when I look at young ladies who are more interested in being pretty than they are being praisers. It scares me. Oh, but God's got to get this message in the heart of some of you that sat before me today. Because the kingdom is transitioning. And some of you are going to be the youth committees and the youth presidents. And somehow you've got to get this in your spirit. Look with me right now at what God called church. We're getting there, church. Hang on to me. Look with me. I'm not going to deal with all of it, but there are some things that I need to remind you that the heart of God said, if it's going to be church, I want that in my church. The first thing that God said is I want a brazen altar. If it's real church, it's got to have a brazen altar. It's made of shatim wood, five cubits long and five cubits broad, three cubits high. It's got horns on the four corners overlaid with brass. It had pans beneath it to catch the ashes and shovels to clean it. It had tools and the great work had to be made of brass. God said, if it's really my church, I want there to be an altar of incense, shatim wood, one cubit wide and one cubit deep. It's got to be two cubits high, horns the same height as the structure itself. And it was all to be covered with pure gold and to have a golden crown around about the top edges. God said, if it's really my church, if you want to know what I want in church, I want 
want a table of shoe bread. Make it a table of shatim wood. Two cubits by one cubit. A cubit and a half high. Overlay it with pure gold. A gold border around the edges. You need gold bowls, gold spoons, gold covers. God said, you want to see what I call church? Then you better get me a breastplate. In my church, I want a breastplate. And he said, thou shalt make upon the breastplate two ends of the breastplate on either shoulder. And thou shalt put two wreathen chains of gold in it in the ends of the breastplate. And the other two ends were to come around to two pouches inside of the breastplate. And he said, you put them in the shoulder pieces of the ephod before it. God said, that's what I want if it's going to be church. Are you still with me? I know I'm getting you with some details right now, but you stay with me. And finally God said, if it's real church, don't even call it real church. Don't even look at it as real church. If it doesn't have the Ark of the Covenant, God said, and thou shalt overlay it with pure gold. Within and without shalt thou overlay it. And thou shalt make the crown thereof gold round about. And God said, these are the things that I want in my church structure. These are the things that I want. If you're going to call this church of the wilderness the church, you've got to have these things because it's an example to a New Testament church. These are the elements that God said you've got to have, symbolic of the precise elements that we have in the church today. But there's one thing that I overlooked that I think we need to take another look at here today. You see, in each one of these elements, in the brazen altar, in the altar of incense, in the table of shoe bread, in the breastplate, in the ark of the covenant, there was something that I intentionally failed to mention. You see, the same God that said, if it's really going to be the church, I want those in it. The same God said, in an ever-transitioning world with all of these transitions that are going on, there's one thing that I need each one of these utensils to have. In fact, God in his divine wisdom understood that if you don't have these things... It's never going to be the church. It's never going to last. It's never going to stand the test of time. And God said, if you want to see what it takes to be the church, you've got to have all of these things. But on all of these things, you've got to get some golden rings. You've got to have rings on the brazen altar. I want four gold rings to the four corners of the altar. On the altar of incense, I want rings of gold under the four corners of the crown. On the table of shoe bread. I want rings on the legs of the table. On the breastplate. I want two rings on the outside and two rings on the inside. On the Ark of the Covenant. I want rings on the corners. Why God? Because God said (coughs) this church is a transitioning church. (coughs) And it's absolutely vital to your spiritual well-being that God said you understand in a transitioning church we've got to be able to move when the pillar of cloud moves we've got to be able to move when the pillar of fire moves but God said I want some golden rings and I'll tell you what we're going to do with those golden rings whenever it comes time for the church to transition I want you to take a stave and instead of touching the ark with your hands instead of touching the incense altar of incense with your human hands I want you to run a stave through there I want to give you some rings so that you can pick it up I'm trying to preach to you today that God said if this church is going to survive the transition we've got to have rings on all of these things so that they can be carried without the damage caused by careless human hands. If the church is going to survive, God said, I've never heard anybody preach about the rings, Brother Cooley. But God was saying if the church is going to survive, we've got to have people that know how to get a grip on something so that their hands don't dull the finish of these precious things that are so important to the church. God was trying to tell them, I've got to give you a way to pick up and carry these precious things without destroying the reason that I gave you those things. Is there anybody in here that understands what I'm saying right now? Would you clap your hands to the Lord and love him? God said you've got to have the ability to carry it without it being diminished or damaged by careless hands, by human reasoning, by human opinions. And God in this place today 
has got to find somebody that knows what it's like to believe in rings. I'm here to tell this church today, this congregation, you're looking at a preacher that believes in rings. We've got to learn how to carry those spiritual elements in our own human hands without breaking down the purity of God's salvation, without breaking down the intensity of the pure gold that God gave us. I believe in the ability to hold on to those things that God gave us without losing the power of that. Can I preach to you just a few minutes here today? The first thing God said is that you need a brazen altar. And on that brazen altar, I've got to have rings. It's symbolic of an altar in your life where flesh dies and eternal commitments are made but I've got to tell you the greatest task before me as I stand in this pulpit today is not to get some of you to come to an altar and pray and touch God and talk in tongues a thousand preachers could do that on a thousand different nights but I've discovered the greatest task of ministry is to get you in such a position that you fall on your face and you make some lifetime commitments to God but when you get up, you get a hold of a commitment that makes you say, I'm going to hang on to this until the day that I die. Yeah. It's easy to be moved in a service like this. But the real test of whether this church is going to survive is if we've got somebody that can reach down and take the rings so that your humanity doesn't diminish this precious church. Why don't we have more young folks with deep commitments in them? It's because we're used to going to the altar and getting a touch. It's because we're used to going to the altar and talking in tongues. But we get up with a mentality that when I struggle again, I can always go back to the altar one more time. And that's why you're in the same spiritual dimension you were five years ago. I've come today to get a hold of somebody and tell you if you're going to be what God intends you to be, you've got to be able to come into a spirit of commitment and hang on to that. And when the cloud starts moving, when God starts moving, you got to be able to hang on to that and say, my commitment's not going to fall away. My commitment's not going to fade away. My commitment's not going to leave when that unsaved girl comes my way. When that unsaved boy smiles, I've got a commitment. We don't need, we, we, we don't need more teaching on how to pray at the altar. We've got that. What we need is more teaching on how to believe in rings so that when you stand up off that altar, there's something inside of your spirit that says, I'm going to carry commitment with me. I'm going to carry convictions with me. I'm not going to let it be diminished by what I think or I don't guess it's going to hurt or I don't think it's going to be a problem. I'm trying to tell you if you're not careful, your commitments are going to end up blemished by the fingerprints of flesh and eventually the purity of that commitment ends up dull and tarnished. Can I tell you today that I'm smart enough to know this is not the first preacher that's ever preached to you at TBC. <clears throat> this is not the first time I've preached to most of you probably, but the reality of it is there's people in here that have made commitments in days gone by, but somewhere when you crawled off that altar saying I'll never do it again, I'll never make that mistake again, I'll never fall to that level again. You got up and you started walking away and something began to dull the finish of the pure thing that God put in your hands. I just want to know if there's one young person in this house today that knows what it's like to get your hands on real apostolic commitment. We've got to have young men and young women that are committed to this message, that are committed to this truth. Is there anybody in here that still believes that without holiness no man shall see the Lord is there just one person in this building that believes that there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby you must be saved is there anybody in this building that'll say brother white I love the oneness enough to die for it I love baptism in his name enough to die on this apostolic way of life. You got to get some rings on this thing.
to be seated. Is there somebody in the house now that believes in rings? You see, there was another thing that had rings. God said, I want an altar of incense. I think it's unique that when you study Jewish history, when you study, there, there's a great book if you ever get your hands on it. It's called The Odyssey of the Third Temple. It's got several everyday miracles that took place in the temple. I, I hate to give away my resources, but that's a good book. And they said that one thing that happened every day that nobody could ever understand is it didn't matter how much wind was blowing outside. It didn't matter the storms of life. The smoke off the altar of incense always rose in a straight line. The wind didn't blow it to the left or the right. Can I preach to this group of people here today and tell you that God loves, God loves worship. And when you worship him, the devil can't trip it, rip it out of your hands. When you're really worshiping God, it goes straight to heaven. The devil can't steal your praise. Your problems can't steal your praise. You've just got to get a relationship with the altar of incense. But if there's one thing that we better get a grip on is we've got to get a grip on the rings of real praise in this generation. <coughs> now, 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 I'm going to tell you what I'm preaching about tonight. I'm preaching to you that we don't need this make-believe praise of a semi-costal generation. We don't need the almost praise of people that have a little touch of God and they try to pervert the praise of God. Can I just make it real plain for you today? I'm not sure we need chunky chicks in leotards running around swinging banners everywhere telling us that's what worship is. I'm not sure that we need praise dancers stepping in our services to show. I'll tell you what we better do. We better get a grip on the ring and say I've got real worship. I've got real worship. I know how to dance. I know how to shout. I don't need a choreograph. Listen, listen. I need somebody that will shout. Somebody that will dance. Somebody, somebody, somebody hear me. We got to get something inside of our heart that said I'm not just here to be pretty. I'm not here to go through the motion. I've got to worship. What have we done to apostolic worship? What? What? Sit down. I'm, I, but you I love good music. I think that's why I like you. I like apostolic music. I like new choruses. I like old choruses. I like songbook songs. I love instrumentals. I love all that business. I stood today and watched this great couple back here playing and, and worshiping over there. I wouldn't give you a nickel for people going through the motions that don't have their heart in it. Can you listen to this preacher when I tell you even the world knows the difference in talent and anointing. Even the world knows the difference in somebody that's got a talent and somebody that's doing it from their heart. I don't think we need to get trapped in our little pretty praise. I've got to tell you sometimes praise ain't pretty. Sometimes dancing ain't dignity. I wish I had some undignified praise. I wish I had somebody that would shout to the Lord right now. Oh God, give us praise that pride doesn't tarnish and prettiness doesn't tarnish. Give us praise. I'm going to tell you today we don't need any more pretty Pentecostal expressions that come from habit instead of the heart. I've told my musicians, my service leaders a few weeks ago, if it's not in your heart, get out of the pulpit. Get out of the pulpit. Get away. It's got to be a matter.
all we're doing is picking up the altar of incense with our human reasoning. Why? Why? Why is so much, Brother Jira, why is so much of what we do in our praise services built on performance instead of praise? Why do we put such emphasis on hitting all the right keys? Why? Because we've learned to come to church and we've watched those who have left other things precious to us tell us this is what it takes. And we forgot about the rings. If I could find somebody, if I can find one person that could lift your hands up right now and say, God, I'm not touching this thing with my hands. I'm not touching it with my humanity. I've got to pick it up. I've got to make a connection to praise that I'll never let go of. <laughs> Some of you have lost stability. You've lost your grip on the rings that let you dance in the spirit. Some of you have lost your ability to hold on to the rings that let you weep for joy, weep for passion. I've got to preach to you, I believe in rings. God never intended the purity of praise to become dull. When your trials come, God said you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who brought you out. Be seated. I've got to hurry. is not meant to glorify the individual but to glorify the one you're worshiping worship is not meant to make you look pretty or spiritual it's meant to make him look awesome it's you better watch out you better get a hold of the rings can you worship him with pure it's not always pretty but it is always pleasing to God What else is church? My brother God said, if it's real church, I want a table of shoe bread. I want some bread that lingers in my presence. Can I propose to this congregation that people do not backslide from real apostolic churches because of a lack of preaching? People do not backslide from real apostolic churches because of a lack of preaching they backslide because they never get a hold of the rings so that when transition comes they pick up all that preaching they've heard they pick up all the <laughs> oh, you're in Bible school now it's a different world now ain't it son it's not like it used to be it's a whole different society and you know what you're going to get in a place like a Bible school and because you're going to rub shoulders with all kinds of people and all kinds of different beliefs, you're going to have some people tell you, well, that's silly. That's just what your preacher preaches. That doesn't mean that it's right. That's just, you know, that, I, they used to preach that years ago, but I, I really don't think that matters much anymore. Why can't we let false doctrine in our pulpit? Why can't we join arms and, 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 and act like that they may be safe for all you? I want to tell you what the problem is. Somebody forgot to put rings on the Word. You need to go back to all that preaching. 
blessing somebody put in your hands in days gone by. You need to go back to all of that preaching, all that teaching that these men have given you. You got to get it in your heart. (laughs) Because if you don't get it in your heart, your hands on the rings I'm afraid what's going to happen after the transition of this church I gotta hurry please be seated <coughs> what else brother white he said if it's really my church I want there to be a breastplate and on that breastplate I want two rings on the shoulders of that breastplate and then I want rings on the inside of the breastplate now listen to me very carefully the rings on the outside had wreathed chains that held a blue piece of cloth that had the names if you please of the church on it the rings on the outside are the thing that held everybody's attention that I represent the church Can I tell you, the breastplate is representative of the church. But what you need to understand today is on the outside, it identified you with the church. But on the inside, it made sure that there were two little pouches for the Urim and the Thummim, the supernatural gifts of God. Can I preach to you right now and tell you when they make fun of your long skirts, ladies, don't you bow your head. You need to get a ring in your spirit and say, I'm glad I can be identified with the church I'm when they make fun of your uncut hair you gotta get something inside of you that said I'm glad that I still join with the church I'm glad that I still can be acknowledged you're one of them you're one of them you're one of them Hey, young men, when you look godly, it's a sign I'm one of them. On the outside, it's the rings that identify us with the church. But on the inside, somewhere, Brother Lawrence, out of sight of what the world sees, there's a ring inside of every sincere person's spirit that connects us with the supernatural. You may see our long skirts, but don't you forget, if I've got it on the outside, I've also got some rings on the inside because the outside is connected to the inside. Oh, can somebody in here worship with me right now? I've come to tell you that if you've got it on the outside, it's just a good sign that you've got it on the inside. Oh, listen to this preacher preach today. We've got to get a relationship with the rings. You got the rings on the outside so the world can see your relationship with God. But you've got rings on the inside that keeps your heart close to the supernatural, the world. Ain't it amazing? The Bible said that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Ain't it amazing, Brother Lawrence, that God constructed this salvation in such a way that he said the world needs to see rings. They need to know that you're not just a religious person. They need to be able to look at you on the outside and see that you're connected to the church. Isn't it amazing? And I have found that there's a lot of televangelism. There's a lot of the charismatic movement. There's a lot of different groups. There's a lot of different people out there that say, well, we talk in tongues and we shout and we dance. But I propose to you, there is a depth of the supernatural that you will never touch. There is a depth of anointing that you will never experience until you've got rings on the outside and rings on the inside. There's no greater touch of God than the one you're going to find when you're faithful to a church. Oh. 
wasn't going to do it, but I feel in my spirit like I need to do it today, Brother Cooley. Thank God you're at Bible college. Thank God you're here learning the things of God. But you better listen to this preacher today when I tell you, you better never sever your relationship with the local church. I don't care if you're the greatest preacher in the world. I told you about my pastor about that tall. But when he puts his finger in my face, I still melt like butter in the hot noon sun. You better never sever your relationship with the church because I don't care how holy you look. I don't care how good you preach. I don't care how spiritual you think you are. You're not in anything if there's not some rings on the inside on the outside they know your allegiance is to the church but on the inside they understand there's something you've got that they don't see I believe in rings stand with me right now I'm not done, but I'm finished. And I want to tell you why. Because I have felt the Spirit of God here for the last two services so rich, so free, so flowing. Nobody had to beg you to worship God because He was here. Nobody had to plead with you to respond because He was here. But wouldn't it be great if in this transitioning church we could all pick up the ark and carry it with us. What would it take in this kind of an atmosphere for somebody in this building to reach out and grab a hold of the rings and when you walk out of here the presence of God the Ark of the Covenant is carried with you. So much of what we call walking in the Spirit is so far short of walking in the Spirit. But what would happen if I could find some of you in this building that would say, God, I'm leaving here. And when I walk out of this place, God, I'm going to carry your presence with me. And when nobody else understands it, I'm going to hold on to it. I'm talking about somebody that can say when my family don't understand it, I've still got an ark in my hand. I'm not going to drag it down. I'm not going to diminish it. I've got to carry the presence of God. Lift your hands up and pray right now. Rings, rings. We got to carry him with us. Rings. We got to carry him with us. Rings. We got to learn to walk in the Spirit. Rings. 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 Somebody has got to walk. Somebody's got to take the presence of God. You got to go to a different dimension of anointing. You've got to have rings. 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 You got to have rings, baby. What you've got on a keyboard, you've got to have when you walk out in the streets. God needs rings. God believes in rings. God's got to have rings. Come. Ah. Ah. Hear me today. Uzzah's problem was not that he touched the ark. His problem was that he forgot about the rings. Uzzah was smitten dead because he forgot 
about the rings. Cry out. Cry out. Pray. Pray, Texas Bible College. Pray, pray, come on TBC, any old doctrine won't do, you got to have rings, come on TBC, any kind of lifestyle won't do, you've got to have rings, you've got to have holiness, you've got to have separation, come on. Come on, TBC. Come on, come on, young lady. Come on, young man. You got to get rings. You got to get rings on your experience. TBC, turn this place into a prayer meeting. Turn this place into a prayer meeting tonight. You don't want to ruin the purity of this gold. You don't want to dull the finish of this gold. You don't want to ruin the purity of this thing God handed you. You've got to have rings. You've got to have rings. That's it. That's it. Ain't it amazing that to get a hold of the rings you always had to kneel? Ain't it amazing that to get a hold of the rings you always had to humble yourself? Rings. I believe in rings. Please like, comment, and subscribe.